I'm not even counting the Celtics. They're, they're not in that conversation. The, the, the Raptors and the Cavs are the two best teams in the East, but I'm going with the Raptors. I'm, I'm on the Dwayne Casey, DeMar DeRozan bandwagon because DeMar's going to do his thing. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, it's not fair to pick on Chuck. You know what though? Like we collectively as an NBA community, um, <laughs> we all need to admit that Skip Bayless got it right. Skip Bayless was right. The Cavs swept the Raptors. Who would have thought? Don't worry, Toronto fans. This video is not going to be a roast video. I I'm, I'm going to get serious here for a minute. Because after the firing of coach Dwayne Casey, there's a lot up in the air with regards to the Raptors' future. After getting swept by LeBron again, there's been a lot of discussion as to whether or not the Raptors should tear down and tank. Should they trade away their stars and rebuild from the ground up? Is it even realistic to expect them to do that? All these questions I'm gonna answer in today's video. What's up guys, my name is Mark. So let's start off by first talking about the series for a little bit because I think it matters what exactly happened to the Raptors to determine what they should do after losing to LeBron. So first off, LeBron had an amazing series, amazing. He didn't shoot very well from three, but overall 34 points, 55% shooting, as well as all the usual box score stuffing numbers that he puts up. Now, many are tempted to say, well, this is just LeBron being LeBron. There's nothing the Raptors could have done. In certain instances, that's true. I mean, LeBron in this series and in the series against the Pacers hit a variety of extraordinarily difficult shots. These fadeaways, these pull-up jumpers, including that game winner that he had in game three, th there's very little that you can do to stop shots like that. Like the old basketball heads say, good offense always beats good defense. But the problem is the Raptors really didn't play good defense this series. They very obviously missed a lot of rotations. They didn't have the necessary help strategy when LeBron got a switch onto him. And it wasn't just LeBron, it was other Cavs players too. You had instances where Kevin Love was being guarded by Kyle Lowry and the Raptors took way too long to double team. LeBron has always been masterful at kicking out to open shooters and drawing in the defense. And the Raptors, despite knowing this, still had no way to stop him. It, it also didn't help that Kyle Korver, Kevin Love, Jeff Green, and J.R. Smith all shot the ball really, really well. There's no question that LeBron, at his A game, surrounded by shooters, is unguardable offensively. But the Raptors made plenty of obvious mistakes that were well within their control. These mistakes could have very well been the deciding factors for two of the four games where it went down to the wire. Is it to say that if they didn't make these mistakes, they would have won? Eh, probably not. But getting swept requires you making this many mistakes. So that's defensively. Now let's talk a little bit about offense. What an utter embarrassment for DeMar DeRozan. I'm not even talking about his numbers or his shooting, but the fact that he was benched during the fourth quarter of a close game is unbelievable. And what makes it embarrassing is that most people, including me, agreed that it was the right decision to bench him because OG Ananubi and CJ Miles and Fred Van Fleet were outplaying him during the fourth quarter. And I actually tweeted out right after the game that this series has shut down any argument for DeMar DeRozan being a superstar. Just shut down, zero. And I know some would say, well, DeMar DeRozan was just never a superstar. And that, that, that really does depend on your definition of a superstar. But I mean, keep in mind, most of us had him in our top five, top six MVP candidates this season. On the other hand, props to Kyle Lowry. Lowry didn't have a great defensive series, although nobody on the Raptors really did, but Lowry at least showed up offensively. I mean, nothing crazy, but compared to his previous playoff runs, much better, much, much better. OG Anunoby had a good series as well. Jonas Valanciunas really took advantage of the Cavs' weak interior defense. He averaged four offensive rebounds per game and drew a lot of attention in the middle of the paint. It'll be interesting to see what the Raptors do with him because he's an interesting player, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. The sports media often likes talking about the mental part of the game. When you just put on ESPN or Fox Sports, there's a lot of psychoanalysis going on when we talk about athletes. And in most cases, 
I'm against that way of talking. I think in most cases, trying to analyze the mentality or the psyche of an athlete is, is more or less a bunch of horse crap. I mean, not so much that the mental part of the game doesn't matter be, because it does, but more so that we as outsiders usually have no idea what's actually going on and pretending like we know exactly what's going on in these people's heads is quite disingenuous in my opinion. And it's also the reason why you hear a lot of athletes complain that the media is overhyping and overthinking a lot of these things. But in this case, in this particular case with the Raptors versus the Cavs, I think it's more than a fair thing to, for us to talk about, mentally speaking. I mean, this is a Raptors team that has been eliminated by LeBron for three years in a row, even after they just had the greatest season in franchise history, the best team in the East in terms of wins, in terms of point differential. It's really hard to imagine the Raptors team getting a lot better than it was this past season, and still they get swept by LeBron. Again, take this for what you will, but I think a lot of you guys would agree with me that when you just looked at the way the Raptors played this series, how uncomfortable they were in the bench, the body language during timeouts, it was just clearly not the same team during the regular season. It's hard for me to imagine that that had nothing to do with LeBron and the Cavs. So I want to get to Dwayne Casey. Did the Raptors do the right thing by firing Dwayne Casey? I asked you guys this question on YouTube and I got mixed responses. From what I can tell, there are both people who thought that yes, he should have been fired. He didn't do a good job coaching the Raptors in the playoffs. Other people say no, that is ridiculous that he got fired. It was DeMar DeRozan's fault. It's not Dwayne Casey's fault that DeRozan became the frozen. It is not Dwayne Casey's fault that the Raptors performed so poorly. It is, it is Dwayne Casey's credit that they won 50 plus games. They had a great regular season, etc., etc. So here's where I stand on Dwayne Casey. I lean towards Dwayne Casey being fired for a good reason. First off, there were way too many strategy and coaching mistakes that Casey made. His decision to let his smaller players switch onto LeBron or Love made zero sense, especially after LeBron and Love both demonstrated how they can take advantage of that situation. Sometimes it can be hard to tell if a team's mistake is on the coaches, poor planning, or the players' poor execution. But in this series, you've undoubtedly had both. Let me put it this way. If Brad Stevens were coaching the Raptors instead of Dwayne Casey, there is no way, zero way, that they would have gone swept. No way. I mean, just off of Stevens' ability to draw out of bounds plays, the Raptors would have won at least game one. That difference is not negligible. I understand that you can't expect to get a Brad Stevens after firing Dwayne Casey, but clearly there was room for improvement. And if you're the Raptors, that's a chance you're willing to take. Regardless, they've made their decision. The Raptors have fired Dwayne Casey. So the question that we really care about is what now? What's the next move? Are they trading DeRozan or Lowry? I'm going to lay out what I think the Raptors should do. And perhaps this may surprise some of you. I don't think the Raptors should rebuild. I understand why people think they should blow the team up. And after all, if you've just had your greatest season in this era and in franchise history and you still get swept in the second round, that's not particularly encouraging. And as far as we can tell, LeBron still has another two to three years of dominance left in him. And even if LeBron leaves the East, let's say, the Raptors still have to deal with the Sixers and the Celtics who are only going to get better and better. So from that aspect, I get why it would make sense for the Raptors to tank and rebuild. But I want to take a step back and just try to approach these situations and topics from as realistic a standpoint as possible. Again, this is more so about what I think the Raptors are going to do, not so much as what they should do, although I think the two are more or less similar. So being realistic, we have to take into account factors that we don't usually take into account, factors like the tendencies of the front office, the salary cap, and financial incentives for ownership. So first, on the front office. Masai Ujiri became the Raptors general manager in 2013. You might remember Ujiri doing this back in 2014. 
It shows you a side of Rodriguez's perspective, and not many general managers would ever think about doing something like that. From watching his interviews and studying some of the decisions he's made, Ujiri strikes me as a bold, confident, and a willing risk taker. I think it's important to point out that Ujiri wasn't the one that hired Dwayne Casey. Dwayne Casey was already the head coach when Ujiri became GM in 2013. So after firing Casey, Masai Ujiri for the first time in his career as the general manager of the Toronto Raptors has the opportunity to decide which head coach he wants to run his team. Dwayne Casey obviously deserves a ton of credit for reviving the Raptors after Chris Bosh left. He deserves credit for developing DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry and Valanchunas and others, but I think he more or less hit a ceiling as a head coach. It's now up to Ujiri to bring in someone new who does have a higher ceiling. I don't think that Ujiri is going to blow the team up without giving it another shot under a new head coach that he himself can now appoint. If a new head coach still can't bring this team over the top, then I think Ujiri would be rational enough to try to think about blowing this team up. The second main reason relates to the Raptors' salary cap situation. So here's a breakdown of their roster and salary situation for the next four years, courtesy of HoopsHype.com. DeRozan is under contract for another three years, Larry and Ibaka for another two years, these three guys take up roughly 80% of the cap space. In this sense, the situation in the Raptors in Toronto is somewhat similar to the situation of the Grizzlies, where they have their money tied up in three players, two of which are all-star level players, but one of which is just overpaid. The difference being that the Raptors, though, have their money tied up in more players than just these three, but also they have a lot more quality young players than the Grizzlies have, in addition to Larry DeRozan and Ibaka. One thing that I think the Raptors do deserve credit for in terms of their regular season, not so much during the playoffs, is that they've really done a good job developing this young core. And this young core was the reason why their bench during the regular season was so good. But back to the salary cap situation, it is just really, really difficult to rebuild when you have so much money tied up in many players. I mean, if you just look at Norman Powell's contract, for example, he is basically owed around $40 million or $50 million for the next four years after this season. And Norman Powell and Valanchunas are two players that are kind of at the age where they can't really be a part of your core if you decide to tear everything down and go for a full rebuild. But also, they're way too young for you to just trade away for younger draft picks. I mean, both of them have yet to hit their prime if you just look at the fact that Valanchunas is 25 and Norman Powell is 24. There's good reason for the Toronto Raptors to bet that Lowry hopefully does not decline too soon, that DeRozan will still have a couple years of prime left in him, Ibaka won't decline too soon, but then they can hope for Valanchunas and Norma Powell to eventually grow into better players, alongside other guys like Ananubi, Siakam, and Fred Van Fleet. Now the third main reason is, as we talked about earlier, financial incentives for the front office. So this is really a concept that I talk about in my Grizzlies video, so you should go watch that because that, that mostly encompasses what I'm gonna say here. But just think about it this way, right? This era, from when DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry became who they became, from about 2014 to present day 2018, I mean, these five seasons are the greatest era of Toronto basketball in its franchise history. Now, of course, that's not saying too much, right? Because the Raptors are objectively one of the least successful franchises in history. With that being said though, these five years, the Raptors have consistently made the playoffs. In some of these years, they've gotten past the first round. In some of these years, they've even gone to the conference finals. They've been able to sell playoff tickets, etc. So regardless of however grim their situation may be because LeBron is just so dominant and they keep getting swept by LeBron, the Raptors have been financially successful. Every single year, they're able to get their fans to come to their games, to care about the team, because the team really is good enough to at least care about. And so the bottom line is this, much like in the Memphis situation, unless the ownership is so hell bent on winning a championship at all costs, and, and when I say all, all, at all costs, I mean at all financial costs, unless the ownership is so hell bent on winning a championship, there's really not that good of an incentive to tear everything down and rebuild. The financial hit you take from doing a decision like that may not justify the marginal benefit or gain that you get from doing a total rebuild and, and trying to get that superstar player. So in summary, the Raptors are in a tough situation. Their salary cap is tied up for a significant amount of time in a lot of players. It's not quite realistic for them to expect to improve much this next year 
from just getting other free agents. If there are improvements to be made, it will have to come from the young core. I'm actually a lot more optimistic about this young Raptors core than a lot of other people are. I think guys like Fred Van Fleet and DeLon Wright and OG Anubi can be a lot better than expected. I think Pascal Siakam actually is one guy that people should really pay attention to. If this guy can learn to get a consistent jump shot, improve his handles a little bit, I think he could be an all-star. Uh, you might think I'm crazy, but I, I do think that. I I've watched Siakam, I've studied the tape. The guy knows how to play basketball. He has the necessary tools. He's only 23. I don't think it's out of the question that he can be an all-star. Now, I will admit this part, and this is the part that I think really is the best reason for the Raptors tanking, is that the Raptors don't really have anyone that you could foresee become that sort of top 10 player that almost is necessary for any team to win the championship. But then again, like I said, there is a huge cost that comes with tearing your whole team down and rebuilding, it comes financially, and also based on analyzing some of Masai Ujiri's motives, I don't think that they'll rebuild this team this summer. I think Ujiri is going to hire a new head coach He's confident enough that he's gonna hire a new head coach and give it another shot with the same core of players. All right, that's it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. If you wanna stay up to date with all the things that I'm up to in the basketball world, although on my daily thoughts about the playoffs as they're going on about free agency later on, make sure to follow me on Twitter at MarkDJump. That stands for MDJ, by the way. Anyways, I'll see you next time.